I'd like to congratulate you on uh, having this incredible meeting and uh, it's uh, topical, useful, uh, fantastic and uh, I don't know what to say following Dr. Ross's talk. Uh, it's just like, like uh, listening to a symphony and it's so enjoyable. Uh, and I, was, I had several questions for you, but I'll ask you later, trying to learn. It's, it is incredible what you have seen. Uh, my talk is just a follow-on from uh, what uh, Dr. Ross has uh, seen. And uh, now I'm going to limit myself, uh, although the chronology says the size of the problem, but you have had. Uh, repeatedly, what is the size of the problem? Um, I will try and talk about the rationale why we should even consider uh, device uh, monitoring of patient progress. That's not what Dr. Ross has been talking about, which is fantastic. And uh, the types of telemonitoring we have heard about the clinical and the cell phones and all of those and how it's being updated and moving extremely fast. We have heard from Dr. Ram about the biochemical biomarkers and uh, that was lovely too. Uh, my job is to talk about the hemodynamic um, monitoring and not only the hemodynamics, but using devices. Maybe uh, that's because I'm a surgeon, not really. Uh, there is no uh, the line of definition between surgeons, cardiologists, and scientists is now disappearing very quickly, and I'm delighted with that. Now, I'm gonna change the slides. In looking at heart failure, we need to have a fundamental look at what's going on. Uh, for too long, we have used uh, the New York Heart Classification uh, grading, and uh, I will show you why it that flowed. And the new classification of staging of heart failure is really very helpful in understanding uh, what to do, at least also in the future. Uh, and the stages will be known to you. Uh, the HA, um, ACC classification, and adopted by the ESC as well. Stage A, uh, that is uh, when you have risk factors, and stage B, uh, when you have heart disease, structural or functional, then you can define it, but actually the patient is asymptomatic. And then we go to C, and that's where most of the heart failure patients we see, all of us, because the patients are becoming symptomatic. And D, when the disaster strikes, and we have to consider other things like transplantation devices, Problem is and that you can see quite clearly that prognosis is very closely linked and this excellent study by Amar and his colleague showing that uh, survival is very closely linked to the stage. And uh, once you are in C1, C2 or D, you are sort of doomed, uh, you need really help. What's even more important is uh, this, uh, I like this slide, which is summarizes the views of everybody, uh, that um, heart failure uh, is progressive and it is uh, sliding from one stage to another almost relentlessly unless with all the interventions, Dr. Rossen, uh, Baumler, and Hisham, or others were trying to do, 
But even that doesn't stop it progressing to stage D, which I see a lot of. The problem with when you, once you reach uh, stage D, treatment, or at least conventional treatment, becomes ineffective. We don't want to be there. Uh, obviously, we are thinking about using devices and going back, but that's another story, not for today. So this is really one of the justifications about the, the rationale, why should we be considering devices to monitor hemodynamics when Dr. Ross has this beautiful non-invasive means of monitoring progression of heart failure. I'll show you how, why. And I'm now differing from Dr. Ross, which I don't dare do, but I'm just doing it. <laughs> um, this study is a beautiful study, which shows that not only the resting filling pressure uh, determines prognosis, but importantly, exercise filling pressure and dynamics are just as important. And you do see the green line uh, with a patient with, in this particular study, uh, with a filling pressure of 12 or less. You would consider that totally normal. I mean, he has no heart failure. But another group who have equally low pressure, filling pressure, 12 or less, but it rises dramatically to 25 or more, the wedge pressure in this case, look at the survival. So we will be reassured by the patient with uh, normal, between inverted commas, filling dynamics, we really must know what happens during exercise. Uh, this is a, a slide from Lynn Stevenson, and would be familiar to you, again, showing why uh, filling pressures are really important, uh, because once it goes up, cardiac output starts going down, and you are doomed. But equally, another uh, excellent paper by Lynn Stevenson, <laughs> Uh, shows that there is a limited reliability of physical signs for estimating hemodynamics in chronic heart failure. Beautiful paper. So what do we do? We have to look at filling pressures uh, in one way or another. And we can do that by either indirect, as I call it, indirect, means by interrogating devices which are already there. So we're not putting the new devices. I'm interested in the latter, though, in the direct, and I'll tell you a bit more. In the indirect, uh, there are at least two, which I will talk about, uh, where you interrogate devices, usually defibrillators or biventricular pacing, or both in the same, and there are two trials. And the direct, uh, are, there are four I would like to talk to you about. The, the last is our own being in development. So what about the indirects? Uh, there is the so-called Evolvo trial. What is it? It is um, a randomized prospective trial. And you can see that there were 89 uh, uh, randomized uh, to no interrogation and another to interrogation of the devices. And they were looking at um, endpoints which are relevant to heart failure. Like what? Like intrathoracic impedance for fluid accumulation, like atrial arrhythmia, like ICD shock delivered. Uh, this trial really was not uh, designed to look 
at heart failure related endpoints. They were trying to look at endpoints related to readmission or, in, or rushing to hospital and saving money. And they succeeded. You can see the uh, in the intervention group where they were monitoring these uh, endpoints, uh, there was less uh, events coming back to hospital to so save a lot of money and good for the patients as well. The second one, the so-called in-time trial, another prospective randomized trial published relatively recently in the Lancet. Now, this is quite an important one, I think, sorry, sorry, because it was a prospective randomized trial and uh, they looked at ventricular, they, these are what they were looking for, uh, ventricular and atrial tachyarrhythmias, interrogating the device, uh, non-invasively, because it's already there, uh, number of extrasystoles, low percentage of biventricular pacing, another prognostic indicator, uh, decreased patient activity, they can monitor that too, uh, by Taylor interrogation of the device, and abnormal intracardiac echocardiogram, echogram I should say, and look what happened. There was a survival advantage. So that's quite interesting from the indirect. But as I declared my bias and said I'm interested in the direct, uh, I will go to the direct. And I'm going to talk about four. The first one is the so-called homeostasis. Uh, these acronyms are very interesting, and there was a paper in New England saying that uh, uh, papers with an acronym get quoted more, yeah. <laughs> and people listen to a lot, so that's why we all use it. <laughs> so. Sometimes you say, well, I'll find an acronym, and then I will uh, uh, have a time to suit the acronym. It's not true. But uh, this is quite an interesting one, which was done uh, a group from New Zealand, but it's a multi-center uh, around the world. And this was a direct measurement of left atrial pressure by putting the device, which you see here, across the interatrial septum, um, and then you have direct left atrial monitoring and act upon that. Uh, this was uh, unfortunately a phase one trial, and uh, we still, but it has disadvantages. Very invasive to puncture the interatrial septum, but also there is a wire which connects the antenna to the device. And that's put under the skin. We can do better than that with all the technology Dr. Meadow uh, Ross was showing us. But uh, equally, uh, the device was calibrated by attaching the, uh, the mobile phone, if you like, uh, which is interrogating the device, uh, to a mouthpiece where you do a valsalva and you equalize uh, the pressure in the airways and the left ear so you can calibrate your device. A bit too much for the patient. I wouldn't like it. Anyway, that was quite an interesting device. There is the other, another one called the Papyrus II trial. And that uh, it depends on, uh, is from Boston Scientific, it's uh, uh, this is the Papyrus 2. We were still waiting for Papyrus 3. And it is uh, a miniaturized device on a pulmonary artery stent. And you can see, it. but it has a battery. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is wireless, so it can be interrogated from outside uh, without wires. The antenna is in there. And uh, we are awaiting the results of that, but the safety trial uh, has been conducted and it is positive safe. 
uh, then the champion trial, and this is the only uh, device right now which has been approved by the FDA. There was a hiccup where the FDA withdrew their approval, but uh, and, and they now have the approval in, in place. Quite interesting. Why? It is uh, a prospective randomized trial, and you can see the chronology there. You can read it for yourself, but the important thing is that you can uh, monitor uh, pulmonary artery pressure, uh, both mean and uh, diastolic, as a reflection of filling pressure of the left ventricle. Uh, <coughs> by placing the device which you see on the left side in the one of the branches of the pulmonary artery, and uh, then the patient has to lie on a bed once a day uh, to get the measurements, transmit them there, and go back to the center, and then have a feedback. And be as, uh, as it may be, it has disadvantages, but it was positive. Look, I mean, there are uh, diminution, both, I mean, improvement in survival as well, of survival free from readmissions, as well as uh, admissions to hospital. So it's positive. Now I come to the last part of my talk, our own device. Our own device uh, is a, a, we call it Times HF. What is Times HF? I actually struggle to find a good, good acronym. <laughs> <laughs> the acronym is Totally Implantable So Device Trial for Monitoring Heart Failure, times HF. What is this device and why are we excited about it? Um, it will enter clinical trial this year, we hope. We've been working on it uh, with a grant from Wellcome Trust at the Imperial College and that uh, was part of with Chris McLeod and myself at the co-applicants for that. And uh, the device is, uh, importantly, these are the characteristics. I will not go into the details, obviously, but it is wireless, battery-less, power-less, totally implantable device. Uh, uses so technology, which is suit uh, surface acoustic waves, uh, and uh, it has unique characteristics, uh, and you can, uh, from outside, uh, interrogate the device and get an accurate pressure uh, of, in, of the pulmonary artery, and we have conducted uh, studies of where to put it and how to put it and how to interrogate it. Uh, but the most important thing about this device is that uh, it provides uh, uh, information continuously, 24 hours. And that, what I have shown you, that we need to know what happens during exercise and stress that device will tell you that uh, and can be transmitted remotely. So we're very, very excited about it and hope that that will be an addition. It's not there yet. Uh, it's developed by Imperial College, as I mentioned, in collaboration with Oxford University. We do the, uh, the device and the implantation and animal studies and all the technical things. Uh, because Oxford have uh, a lot of experience in like uh, the uh, mobile telephone technology in medicine. We collaborate with them and uh, we hope to tell you more in the very near future. But going back just before I conclude uh, to fundamental things like uh, saying that heart failure is not an acute event. I mean, it's shown that these staging A, B, C, D, and D, 
It's very, very slow, but it's there to get you. And we have to think about it in those terms. Uh, the other things, apart from being very slow, that, like Lynn Stevenson has shown, that um, signs uh, do not tell you what are the feeling pressures. Furthermore, patients can be asymptomatic, but you can see, and that slide is taken from the uh, champion trial, we called it compass at one time, and you see that at least uh, 21 days before the patient had symptoms compelling him or her to come into hospital, uh, the, 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 the thing was going up. So we need to treat heart failure early, like you're telling us, Dr. Ross, uh, to be effective, but not only to be effective, but you might alter the whole natural history of the disease, because uh, this is from Lynn Stevenson again, and I, I like this slide a lot uh, because it, it says about lifetime readmission risk after hospitalization. It's readmission. And there are two peaks, one shortly after discharge, uh, but another later on. And while we can treat peaks, we do not want that. There is a plateau, and that's where it could be really important uh, between peaks and can we lower that plateau uh, or the feeling pressure and the readmission by our devices? Uh, I think we can and we might have uh, quite an impact on the disease. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the use of uh, devices for monitoring heart failure is very promising in several ways. One, uh, it has been shown now almost uh, definitively, but a lot more has to be done, obviously, to reduce readmission, improves quality of life, and at least in one trial, it shows that it can prolong uh, life. Uh, what are we going to do in the future? Can we really use such technology uh, in altering the nature of this spiral of going down with heart failure? And are we ever going to be justified to use these devices in earlier stages of heart failure? It remains to be seen. Thank you. So I, I have, thank you, that was a wonderful talk. I have to say I see us less as competing and more as thinking about uh, a continuum of where you're going to use maybe a remote monitoring and then for certain patients clearly an implantable system and it's also the ways that we can share the technology because there's much from, you know, when I think about the platform, at least as we add layers in, you can imagine how that platform in a home environment will effectively create a virtual clinic. So we have a point of care for pennies, BNP testing, lights and creatinine that can all be done in Bluetooth technology, fitting into an algorithm. We can add hemodynamics into an algorithm, and the reality is, without having to have the patient come in, you should be able to know they're exercising less and the BNP is up and their numbers are up, that patient's in impending heart failure or numbers are stable, BNP is up, maybe there's creatinine is an issue. I mean, you can see how layering the technology, I think, is incredibly exciting. I totally agree and I, I think that a comprehensive mm -hmm. care and uh, we in Aswan, for example, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we have a, a recovery program using lethal assist devices with pharmacologic therapy or other types of therapy. Uh, what I keep saying, we're touching uh, the top of the problem and the edge of the avalanche. I mean, there's something huge and we should have a comprehensive heart failure care like you have very envious of what you have and what Amr is uh, establishing here 
a comprehensive heart failure care and then we can uh, graft on it all these new things uh, but uh, the question of uh, can we prevent this disease at one time as well uh, thank you for the comment any questions okay. thank you sir thank you very much for, being, for this nice talk